So now we are launching on the third canto of this book, the debate of love and death. In the earlier canto, death was giving his philosophy of existence, how things happened, how they came, and what is going to be their end. Ultimately, according to him, everything came out of nothing and all will disappear into nothing. So it becomes a sort of a purposeless creation. Why should it come at all and then again disappear, you see? Purposeless creation. But essentially the point is, he is denying any possibility of the higher powers of the spirit entering into this creation. They will not, they cannot. It has not happened and therefore it will not happen. Because it has not happened, <laughs> therefore it will not happen. That is the sort of uh, strong argument he is making. So he is really the great denier of the existence of space possibilities in this creation. And therefore we can see how he is really standing across the path of the divine event, the huge forwarding mind of night alone. He stood there denying God. So that huge forbidding mind of night. Who is that mind of night? What is that mind of night? It is this gentleman. It is this gentleman. He is standing in the way of the divine possibilities, of the divine event moving forward. It cannot happen. And therefore, if it has to move at all, according to Savitri, then she has to remove him away. She has to take him away from the road, from the block. Either he should disappear or he should get transformed, change. In a way, what is going to happen is he cannot disappear. And therefore, the only option for him is transformation. Savitri has to work for his transformation first if the divine event has to move forward. See, the mother spoke of the four asuras who separated themselves from the divine source and became independent and opposed the divine himself. She also says that of these two, of these four, of these four, two have conceded that their role is over and they, they can move away. But death is still there and death is not going to get transformed. He denies. And that was the problem the mother was facing all along the problem of physical transformation, it is locked with the power of death, which is still operating in the physical. So she has to work now towards his transformation. He cannot be removed away, he cannot be changed at all, you see. The yoga of the cells means that, basically transforming him. Now the other fourth asura, falsehood, or what she calls the Lord of Nations. Now, of course, I have been telling you that whether falsehood is presence because of death or because of falsehood is present death. Who is the cause of whom? Is falsehood the cause of the presence of death? or is the presence of death is going to give rise to falsehood. 
according to theorem, as the mother says, it is because of falsehood that death is present there. Which would mean that even if death is removed, is transformed, falsehood is not going to go away, according to him. But mother also says that according to Savitri, according to Shrivendu, the cause of falsehood is death. So the moment you remove death from the scene, automatically you have taken care of falsehood also. Falsehood also is there. So the entire thrust of Savitri is now focused on death and he is now coming with his full force, what we would call in the form of a debate, in the form of an argument, in the, in the form of encounter, etc. But actually it is an occult battle which is, which is being fought on the occult plane between death and Savitri. So Savitri has to conquer death has to win victory over death. Her yoga was specific for that and she was given full assurance that with this yoga, you will be able to take care of death in this creation. That is what she is going to do here. Now, <clears throat> until now we have seen that death was arguing from different planes. First, she started giving the vital emotional argument, what Savitri was doing, etc., etc., his body's lust, this thing, that thing, etc., etc. Then he elevated his argument to the mental level and started arguing on the mental level also. Now it is towards that Savitri is going to give her answer to death. Answer means she is going to sort of through her force to take care of this occult aspect of the denier of the world. He is denying, no, this is not possible, this is not possible. It's not an argument. It is a force which is operating. And therefore, she has to work on that force itself directly, you see. It's not an argument, mental argument at all, you see. So therefore, this canto is a little long canto, about 600 lines, more than 600 lines in two sections. <laughs> yeah, there are two sections, 141 and 142. In the, <laughs> in the first section, you've got 109 sentences. And in the second section, you have 190 sentences. Quite long one. So about 300 sentences. 300 sentences means roughly about 1,000 lines. More than 1,000 lines, actually. It's one of the biggest, longest sections in Savitri, you see. Mm. In this section, in this, in this particular uh, canto, there are roughly 60 revisions compared with the original edition of Savitri. Most of them are of a minor nature, perhaps just for one or two, but they are also not very significant. But in all, there are roughly 60 departures between this and the revised edition of Savitri, 1951 and 1993. <clears throat> so Savitri now has a long job to do, big job to do, difficult job to do. Although the title is debate, it's not really a debate in that sense. It is the impingement of the occult force against the occult force. That is the debate. You see. But it is a debate also in the sense that practically a great amount of material which is here, the details which are here, you can find straight in the life divine. What she is saying here is already said in the Life Divine. But unfortunately, Mr. Death, he has not read the Life Divine. 
and therefore <laughs> he is not aware of that thing and Savitri has to therefore re repeat the whole of light divine for his sake. Now, she is not simply repeating light divine. People often say that Savitri is after all light divine versified. Light divine put in the form of verse. Light divine put in the form of poetry. It is not so. Although on a certain conceptual mental level, you may have correspondences between these two, but you can feel really the sort of force which is there even in the arguments which are there in, in Savitri. They have a different weight, a different power, different strength than what you would see in the Life Divine. Same portion you read in Savitri and in Life Divine color you feel that there is a difference between these two in terms of their charge of power which they are present, you see. So that is the power of poetry also, in a way. But he has put something special in Savitri. Actually, Sri Bindu has left his consciousness fully in Savitri. So, reading Savitri, living in Savitri, being always connected with Savitri, is to be in the consciousness of Sri Aurobindo. Always. You absorb it and it keeps on kind of working on you, see. That does not really happen to that extent, in that manner, in other works of his. Here you feel something fiery, blazing, powerful, luminous, you see, in, in, in Savitri. So now Savitri is about to start her reply to death. A sad, destroying, cadent voice sang, voice of death, sad, destroying the music of destruction. That is what you have got here, you see. Music of destruction. The voice sang, slip down, you see. A sad, destroying cadence, the voice sang. See the, what a beautiful line this one is. You have got Sad, destroying, cadence, voice, sang. Five S sounds. Sibilance. Five S sounds. Sad, destroying, cadence, voice, sang. <laughs> so it gives you a kind of purity also to the whole person. A sad, destroying, cadence, the voice, sang. The same to lead advancing march of life into some still original name. That is what the voice was doing. It was leading life into the inane, into nothing, into the void. Now, it is true that the voice is leading life. You see, life is not small life here, capital life, L. L is capital L, you see. The very power, life, consciousness here in existence, that was going to disappear into the void, into the nothing. That is what death is doing. So where is the place of death? Where is the house? Where is home? Where is the realm? It is in the void, in the inane. And he is taking the spirit of Satyavan, march of life, of truth, into the inane, into the void, into the truth. And behind them is following the power of light, Savitri. It is that, it is that power who is going to 
arrest that disappearance of life into the nothing. She is there, she is going to hold it back, you see. She cannot allow it to dis disappear like that, you see. That much. So that much of life is into the in the And therefore, he says, it seemed to lead into the inane. But it is not really leading into the inane. It cannot lead into the inane. Because behind them is present Savitri. Had she not been there, it would have suddenly gone into the pit. Finished, disappeared. Therefore, it seemed, you see, he, he, as long as Savit is present, it cannot happen. Into some still original, in a, original, in a, so it is the creation's void for a purpose into which everything will go back. It is, as you have in the very first page, on the very first page of Savitri, the first and the last nothingness. Two nothingnesses. The first nothingness and the last nothingness. That last nothingness from which everything has come up, it is that original in then here. It seems still original in then. So that original inane is not that up there, but it is down below here. But now that it seemed is answered by putting but. But Savitri answered to Almighty death. Again, Almighty death. That is the power of Almighty death to lead life into the Indian. He can destroy, bring to naught, bring to nothing the whole creation, the whole existence. And Savitri is going to take care of it. And therefore, life cannot disappear into the Indian. But Savitri answered to Almighty Death. Now that is something very great. You see, kind of a tribute, admission of the strength and the power of Death. He is Almighty. He is Almighty because He can bring the whole creation to nothing. An ordinary person, ordinary mind cannot do that. It is a God's creation. And if God's creation has to disappear, the power of the destroyer should also be strong, almighty. And therefore, his almighty death we see. O oh, dark browed sophist of the universe, O oh, dark browed sophist of the he, he was giving metaphysical arguments to Savitri. I did this, I did that, all kind of things. Therefore, his, his sophistry of language, of argument, is what Savitri is first dismissing. Sophistry of her argument. A dark browed sophist for the universe. So if Almighty Death is dark browed, the person who would answer it has to be bright brow, luminous brow, shining brow, you see. It cannot be this one. Dark brow, sophist of the universe. His power, this power, extends over cosmic manifestation, universe. It cannot go beyond that. He is a power in the universal manifestation. And if 
he has to be can, taken care of. The one who should come here has should be transcendental, not universal. So the dark browed and universe gives you again the character, the nature, the personality of Savitri. That she is not dark browed, she is beyond the universe. And therefore, although he is almighty, it is she who can take care of that almighty death, being beyond the universe, beyond not dark browed. O oh, dark brow, sophist of the universe, who weighs the real with his own idea. Now, your life divine begins with this. <laughs> <laughs> he is talking of universe. She is talking of other universe. So in the universe, what you have got? In the universe, you have only the idea. You don't have the real idea. Real idea exists beyond the universe. Real idea is the philosophical name for supermind. Supermind. When real and idea become separate, then the problems start coming up. In the supermind, they are all together at once. Reality and idea, what you imagine, what you think, is also at the same time real there. It is there. You want a book in the real idea, it is there. It's not the idea of book and the reality of the book. They are separate. Here in our world, you have to write the book and then you have to go to the press, you have to get it printed. Of course, there, the book does not cost any money. Here, you have to pay. You have to pay for this. Yeah. You have to pay for the book. <laughs> no, I think uh, the, the, I think uh, it is true. You don't have to read a book in that sense. But the purpose, what is the meaning? What is the content? What is the quality? What is the character of a book? What does it represent? It represents something which is concretized, which is not just big. So when you say book. In the world of supermind, it means something which has taken a definite concrete shape. So it becomes a power of realization. You see, it is world which is concretized. It's not vague, something. So you need a book there to concretize, even if you have got some idea to do that, you see. see. In Vimala Vimala, he said, in Samadhi, he read a book. Yeah. In the Samadhi? Different kind of Samadhi. Oh, yeah. different sentence, and then we have pages and pages. Yeah, there are, yeah, that's right. In Samadhi. So, you do need book there for a purpose, you see. Don't say. <laughs> so, there, that book is a different thing. When it comes here, then. You start interpreting a book, you start quarreling with arguments, all those things. So that because real and idea got separated. See, that is what actually happened. In fact, uh, to quickly extend the idea of the book, walk, the spoken word, what you call it. Now, the spoken word has all the power in it, in that thing. And when it comes down, 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 then it becomes the kind of language we speak. You have got you know, first Vaikari, Madhyama, Paschanti, and then Para. These are the four stages of work, of speech. Vaikari, the spoken language we understand. Madhyama, the language between this and that middle 
and then Pashyante, it is the same language. You see, you don't really read, you see language. And beyond that is the transcendental Paravani. Para, uh, transcendental Shibi. That is what we got the mantra sings, you know, in, uh, uh, in, in book three, uh, sorry, book uh, four, canto three. Para, para, para is a transcendental speech. Para, what you para, vani, 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 vani means speech. Vani means speech. Para, then pashanti, pashanti means sin. And then medium, middle, madhyama, and then last comes vaikari, the human language which we speak. So, so you, you have that language also there, you see. So you need that language for communication. See, when Mother and Durga used to meet every year in the month of October, she used to come to visit the Mother, no, Durga. And the Mother used to spend a lot of time with her. She used to be there with her for two days, three days, like that. And they used to talk. The mother and Turga. Now she says, Do you think that we are talking in French? <laughs> you see, we are talking in another language, you see. So there is there, there is there is a book, divine book is the life divine is there, Savitri is there. You can't say Savitri does not exist or need not exist there. It is there. It has to be there, you see. So uh, in the the, the book of the Divine Mother, Canto 3, the house of the spirit, in the house of the spirit, Ashwapati created a new and marvelous world. A new and marvelous world rose in the house of creation, in the house of the spirit. And his problem was, all right, now that exists there, how to bring it down here? And therefore, he has to approach the Divine Mother, the Divine Goddess. Look, my job is done. To create the new world there is done. Now, it is your responsibility to bring it down. I will walk away, I will stay away from that. You have to come down and do. And therefore, Savitri takes the birth. She has to take the birth because this fellow has created the world and it has got to be fulfilled. <laughs> so she takes the birth and brings down that new creation. So when you say that in the house of the spirit, Ashapati has established a new and marvelous creation, it is saying that Sri Havindu has established the divine Savitri in the house of the spirit. He has established in the house of the spirit the divine Savitri. It is there. Now the whole question is, whole problem is, the whole issue is to bring down the Savitri into the mortal world. He has done a part of his job. Whatever had to be done, he has done it. Now, it is the Divine Mother who has to make that Savitri come down here and teach us what it is, you see. So, real and idea, <laughs> they are two different things and all this in their real idea, idealism, ideality, they exist there. Without that, nothing can happen here. Who veil the real with his own idea, hiding with brood of this nature's living fame, masking eternity with the dance of death. Thou who hast woven the ignorant mind into a screen and made of thought errors purveyor and scribe and a false witness of mind's servant sin. Of mind, servant, to sin. Thou hast woven the ignorant mind. So he was talking, his argument in the previous canto was 
your thought, your imagination, it's not real at all, you see. So she is now focusing on, on thought and mind, ignorant mind. And what is the character of this thought, of this ignorant mind? It is the supplier of the needs of error. Or where the supplier of provisions, he supplies whatever is required to thought. Thought supplies whatever is required by error. Actually, purveyor, in the common sense, is the supplier of provisions. But it has a little uh, cultural background also. Supplier is a person or the person employed for the provisions to be made available to the sovereign, to the king, to the king. So whatever the household or the king palace would require, it was the duty of the purveyor to see that that is met. Go to the bazaar, go here, go there, whatever is required. He has to supply those kind of things, you see. So, and made of thought. So, what is thought after all? It is a supplier of whatever is required by error. Error is supported, upheld by the thought who gets the supplies from the purveyor. So you think of all that thing and then you start imagining and arguing around that thing you see. And made of thought, errors purveyor and scribe. Scribe of course has a little classical connotation. You see when you combine with purveyor, the sense of the scribe is not one who writes. Scribe now is used for a journalist also. Speech writer, he is a scribe you see. It is not in that sense, this word scribe is used here. The scribe is one who keeps account, who keeps records of all these things, you see, of all these things. He is the scribe. Purveyor and scribe, well, of course, we are familiar with the word scribe. Nirod Baran was even the scribe. <laughs> But he was simply taking down dictation, basically. But scribe is one who keeps account all the clerical work which is required in the household for the purveyor. He is to do all that kind of a thing. So thought is errors, purveyor and scribe. So how, how, uh, uh, what shall I say, concretely he has described the role of thought as a person. It's not an abstract word, no thought. Thought is the person, is a sovereign, and he is doing this thing, that thing, that thing, is a So that is the difference between life divine and Savitri. And made of thought, errors, purveyor, who has made thought? Poor ignorant mind. And false witness of mind's servant sense. Mind. and sense. We will talk of five senses. Hearing, smell, touch, taste, expression, five senses. Now actually behind these five senses, the primary sense is mind, manasa. Behind these five senses, manasa is the primary sense. and therefore mind. So when, when that comes into operation, then it becomes a witness, you have witnessed it. You think of food and your tongue starts becoming wet, you see. <laughs> Means the idea of the thought is to go there and activate certain things and then you get this reaction here. An estate, or the sorrow of the world, estate. 
No, she is giving very great qualification to him, scoring in essay. One who enjoys beauty, fine details, you enjoy connoisseur. Food. You don't just eat food, you enjoy the taste of each and every item. Then you give an aesthetic. So he is, in fact, now an aesthetic of sorrow. He is enjoying fine, fine, fine details of sorrow, sorrow of the world. Champion of a harsh and sad philosophy. So that is what he's abhorring, sad philosophy. That is what he's abhorring, you see. Thou hast used words to shut her out the light. You want the word. I mean, you don't want light to enter it all. You have put a screen there and called in truth to vindicate a lie. See? Well, that is what the devil will do. He will always use everything for his purposes. You see? And called in truth to vindicate a lie. A lying reality is falsehood's crown and a perverted truth, a richest gem. Perverted truth is the richest gem of falsehood, of reality, a lying reality. Now that her, a lying reality, her stands for reality. And a perverted to her richest gem. Does it correspond like that? Her. <laughs> oh, death, thou speakest truth, but truth that slays. Obviously, you are speaking correctly everything, but for what purpose, in what manner? to lay the march of life into the original innan. To lay the march of life into original innan. It is for that purpose you are speaking truth. And perverted truth, her riches, gem, sorry. I answer to, sorry, not truth, but truth that slays. So his argument, so to say, is to take the creation back into the Indian, to slay, to destroy, the, to nullify the existence totally, you see. And therefore, Savitri, I answer to thee with the truth that saves. I will not allow this march of life to end into the Indian. I will take it to the divine. I will not allow that thing to happen at all. O oh, death, thou speakest truth, but truth does slay. So you can say he is the denier and she is the one who is speaking of the affirmative spirituality, the positive aspect of it, the change which will lead to the divine manifestation, the contrast. So that is the debate between these two. One dragging to the original in main, one trying to bring back to the powers of the spirit. That is the debate. That is the tussle. I answer to the with the truth that slays. A traveler new discovering himself, one made of now she is giving the first lesson in life divine to death. <laughs> Her first lesson in life divine begins. See, he was talking of how the creation, I curved the vacant ether and dot out space, this, 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 this. Sorry, 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 it is not that. What has happened? This is what I'm going to describe to you now. A traveler, new discovering himself, one made of matter's world, his starting point. Traveler, who is this traveler? Who? No. 
no, no. He is the original creator. The supreme. He has become the traveler. And he has decided to accept matter as a starting point. New, he wants to discover himself anew. If I go through matter, how will I look like? I want to find out. <laughs> if I create a new world here, how I will look into that world? I want to see that and therefore I accept this possibility of the void of ignorance of matter and all that. So that I can see myself differently than what I am now. In a way, I am living in my supreme state. I am very happy, very blissful and all that, etc, etc. But let me see if I can find some other kind of a happiness. I am sort of tired of this happiness for a change, for a new taste. Let me see if I can find out some other way. And therefore he starts discovering something new, new discovering. What is the new discovery? Let me first get out of my existence totally and emerge again to see myself differently. I am here, I am totally absorbing myself into myself. So I am nothing now. I have absorbed myself into myself. Now out of that total absorption of myself into myself, let me see if a new creation can come up, how it will look like. So he has become in that sense a traveler now to do all that things. A traveler, new discovering himself, one made of matter's world, his starting point. So matter is not the starting point. It is somebody who has made matter a starting point. He made of nothingness his living room. The void he has created for the, I had totally absorbed myself into myself. So there is nothing of me. I am totally now unaware of myself. When I am absorbed, I have totally become unaware. I have become inconscient, I have become ignorant, whatever you want to call it, you see. Because I have no faculty of now recognizing anything. I have absorbed myself totally, you see. One made of matter's world, his starting point. He made of nothingness, his living room. So that is how he has created nothingness. By the power of total self-absorption. When every faculty, every power, every instinct, every potential is withdrawn, what do you have got? Nothing. The void. He made of nothing his living room and night a process of the eternal light and death a spur towards immortality. So you are there now taking me to my immortality. You are serving the purpose of leading me towards immortality. In the transitional phase or whatever you want to call it, you have a functional role to play and that role is to take me towards immortality, my own immortality. In other words, what Savitri is telling, which was not spelled out by death, she is talking now of the involution. This is nothing but involution. A traveler has absorbed himself and made nothingness his starting point. Up there here, he is plunged into it. Made of nothingness is living room and night a process of the eternal life. So there is a purpose, there is a function in having this night, in having this death, etc. etc. God wrapped his head from sight in matter's cow. 
So he has put a hood on his own head and covered himself. I don't want to see myself, you see. <laughs> Matter's cowl. Wrapped his head in Matter's cowl. So this is, this is the, the Savitri way of giving you the process of involution. In Life Divine, you have 10 pages describing <laughs> how involution takes place, you see. God wrapped his head from sight. Whose sight? His own. His own sight. I closed myself. I totally absorbed myself. In matter's cowl. His consciousness dived into inconscient depth. This is the plain statement of involution. The supreme plunged into the void and created inconscience. Unawareness, inconscience, unawareness of his own. All knowledge seemed a huge dark nation. So again he says, seem. Because there is a purpose. He has put on this matter scowl. He has dived into depth. He has for a purpose, you see. Therefore, it seemed, all knowledge seemed a huge dark nation. Infinity wore a boundless zero's form. Boundless zero's form. Obviously, it is infinity himself who has become zero. Therefore, it has no bounds. It is also infinite. Infinity, oh, a boundless zero form. Now, this boundless zero, in the light divine, I got the phrase. The boundless finite. Boundless finite. In the right one, boundless finite. Finite, yeah. Now, this boundless finite, that itself is a phrase from Einstein. <laughs> yeah. He calls this universe a boundless finite. It has no bounds at all, yet it is finite. The curvature of space and time is such that it is bound, it is finite. But <laughs> but there is no boundary, so to say there. So that, that phrase Shevandu has uh, uh, picked up from Einstein, boundless finite. And that he has transcribed here into Savitri as boundless zero. Infinity wore a boundless zero's form. You see, I mean, they exp it's like, like, like a balloon you are living on the surface of a balloon. That is the general uh, analogy which is given. You imagine a balloon and there is an ant sitting on the surface of the balloon. And wherever it goes, it always stays on the surface of the balloon. It cannot go out of the balloon at all. Yet, it is, it is finite in that sense. But it is boundless, it is, it is infinite in the sense that it can go anywhere and still it does not get exhausted at all. So the zero, it's not finite. Ba zero, is finite. Is finite. No. Well, I mean, the, the, uh, in the technical sense, no. In which sense? Even in this boundless zero. Zero means nothing. Yeah. So, void has the void here is such that it has no boundaries. There is no boundaries. Huh. Yeah, okay. So, therefore, it is boundless. How can this, the nothing has boundaries? <laughs> See, that, that, that's, a, that's the analogy I was giving you to a balloon. No, let, let's speak about the spiritually, not, uh, not 
Yeah. No, what it means is that no, no, what it means that the zero is confined to itself. Zero is confined to itself. But that zero itself is infinite. Therefore, it is boundless, yet zero. So, what is the problem then? Zero is, yeah, I mean, zero, zero is, uh, uh, yeah, boundless finite, when you are talking about boundless finite, at the phrase, I was equating that phrase of finite with zero. The Einsteinian phrase is, we are living in a boundless finite universe. Front quantum of physics. We know the finite. And one time we discovered that this finite is boundless. Yeah, this is the, the, the this is the this is the analogy, this is the this is the analogy I was giving you of a balloon. You are sitting on the surface of a balloon, it is finite, yet it is infinite. It has no bounds. No, for me the balloon has a bound. Yeah, but <laughs> Yeah, it's true. See, I mean, we, we are living in a universe like that. We are living on the surface of a balloon and uh, 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 we cannot escape it. Therefore, it is finite. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that is why that is how they expand. They expand. They expand the universe. The expanding universe is what the balloon is blown up and growing, 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 growing. Now what is happening? This ant and this ant, they are seeing that they are separating from each other, but they are still on the same finite world. <laughs> All knowledge seemed a huge dark mission, infinity for a boundless zeros form. So Savitri has already read Einstein's theory of relativity. <laughs> His abysms of bliss became insensible deep. Abysm. Now here, abysms means here the profundities. In the sense of profundities, not abyss. Of bliss became insensible deeps. They have lost their sensitivities. Eternity. A blank spiritual vast. So this is the total involution. A eternity, a blank spiritual vast. Annulling an original nullity, the timeless took its ground in emptiness and drew the figure of a universe that the spirit might adventure into time and wrestle with adamant necessity and the soul pursue a cosmic pilgrimage. So in these few sentences, seven sentences, rather six sentences, she had described quickly the involution. His abysms of bliss have become insensible, have become blank, a spiritual vast, the opposite. That is the involution. I can't understand this. And then original nullity. This original name, this is how the original name happened. She is describing how the original name has taken place. This is what he was talking of. Everything is from that. Everything is from that. But she is going back. No, no, no. 
there is somebody who has created this in men for a purpose. He has become a traveler. And therefore, the march of life begins now from that. He has become a traveler, no? For new discovery. I want to discover myself in a different manner. Therefore, I disappear from myself. You see, if I don't disappear from myself, there is nothing new then for me. Therefore, I should totally disappear. That disappearance means evolution. What the Brahadara Annika Upanishad says, I, uh, is it Brahadara Annika? Sorry. Chaitirya Upanishad says, I want to be many. I am alone. I feel very lonely. Feel uh, the necessity of companionship. How do I do that? I want companions. I want to be many. Bahusyam, <laughs> Bahusyam, many. Bahusyam, Praja, Yeti. I want to have Praja, many, many, many. I am alone. I feel very lonely, tired, not happy. How do I become many? Therefore, I disappear from myself. And then out of it, the many will come out. That many, at the moment, they are all ignorant, stupid creatures like we today. <laughs> but that many has to become like me, divine. That is the purpose of my becoming many. So it is a travel, it is a process that we are standing here in between, you see. Bahusyam, Praja, Yeti, Bahusyam, many. Bahu means many. Praja, creations. I want to be many. So I disappear myself totally from that. Without that, it cannot happen. See, if I remain there, I will see myself everywhere. Then what is the new in that? All my sensibility, all my faculties of awareness, of cognition, they must disappear first. Then only the new faculties can come. So, that is something very great of him. To nullify yourself totally like that is the greatest act of being egoless. Totally ego, nothing of me. And when you become that egoless, then you can become truly everybody. He is a vision of bliss. So, he, she is talking here now. He is a vision of bliss. Of course, he is. She is talking of God. That he stands for God here. Obviously, this God is not the theological God. This God is the Supreme Himself. Paratpara. So, this phrase is abysm of bliss. Again, it goes back the same Upanishad. From bliss we came. In bliss we live, we go back into bliss. That is the travel. To be many, to have creation. And the soul pursues, yeah, and therefore he says, and so now she is now talking now the other part of it. Annulling is original nullity, the timeless took its ground in emptiness. Timeless took its ground in emptiness. That's the void. So from there, the time will start happening. Well, actually, when the total involution took place, sorry, when the total separation from the divine 
occurred. You have totally absorbed yourself. You see the horror of this creation as the mother says. And then the divine plunged into that void. The divine plunged into that void. And then the movement started appearing. Now, the divine plunged into that void when the total separation took place, when the total absorption was there, so to say, that the mother says, he is the permanent avatar and his name is Satyavan. It is he now who is present in that void. He has withdrawn himself and again plunged into it as a seed or whatever you call it. And from that, he has started. So that is the beginning of time. Timeless. He is there all along, always. So that involution, the total absorption is followed by the plunge the divine into the void. And then the process begins. Otherwise, how does it happen? Took its ground in emptiness, took its ground. He has taken the station now and drew the figure of a universe that the spirit might adventure into time. So that is what is the work Satyavan is doing. In Savitri, you don't see anything what that fellow is doing and why, why Savitri is fighting for him. The spirit adventure into time. That is the work he has been doing silently behind the whole scene. And wrestle with the adamant necessity and the soul pursue a cosmic pilgrimage. The soul pursue a cosmic pilgrimage. That is what he is doing. A spirit moved in black immensities and built a thought in ancient nothingness. Now, now she is slowly bringing into picture timeless time, evolution, growth, progress. And spirit moved in black immensity and built a thought in ancient nothingness. A soul in God's tremendous void was lit. A soul in God's tremendous void was lit. God's tremendous void, the soul, that is the presence of Satyavan there in the language of Savitri, in the language of the mother. So first avatar, yeah, you can see, plunge, yeah, that's right. First, not only first, permanent avatar. Yeah. <laughs> Is it? Oh, that is that is in the process of time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> A secret laboring glow of nascent fire. What a phrase you see. Now this is a description you won't get in light divine. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Yeah. Nissan. Because it has now been just lit. Nissan. Fire. Fire. It is just lit into the void. A secret laboring for a purpose for timeless to go through the time and proceed on its endless paths. In the Puranas, they call it Vishnu, the inconscient Vishnu. He is asleep there, always. Asleep on the bed of a serpent with thousand hoods. Serpent with thousand hoods. On that bed he is asleep permanently there. Thousand hoods, serpent. Serpent are the powers, energies which are locked there, on which he is asleep. The Puranic Vishnu. 
He is there for a purpose, you see, according to the Puranas. The inconscient Vishnu. So, I, I think I told you earlier, no? On one occasion, Narad happens to go to meet this Vishnu. He will go and meet Vishnu anywhere, everywhere. So, he goes to Patala in the lowest pit there and sees Vishnu there. And then this Vishnu is being worshipped by the sons of darkness. Diti, who has separated herself from the divine, her sons, her power, they are offering their worship to this Vishnu who is asleep there. You see. So he says that, look, that worship of the divine is there everywhere. You are seeing it as dark, but the aspect, the spirit of worship is present even in that place, even in the darkness. Who is offering that is a separate matter. For what is separate? But the aspect of worshipping the divine, the supreme, is there everywhere. And therefore, Narada is supposed to be, is called the supreme bhakta, the matchless bhakta. Everywhere he says he is Vishnu, everywhere. A soul in God's tremendous void was lit, a secret laboring glow, you see, see she says glow of nascent fire. It is still glow, you see. In Nahil's gull, his mighty puissance wrought, he is of God. His puissance. You see, everywhere in Savitri, he got presence and power. The somnambulist self, sorry, the inconscient self and the somnambulist power. The inconscient self and the somnambulist, the inconscient being and the power shakti. Everywhere you have got this thing, power and presence in different aspects revealed in Savitri. Here, first, it is God, his presence, then his puissance, power. His power now has started coming into operation. A secret laboring because of labor, power. In Nahe's girl, his mighty puissance wrought. She swung her formless motion into shades, made matter the body or the bodiless. It is her work to give body, give form, give definiteness, concreteness to one who has no form, who has no body. For what purpose? So that he becomes a concrete individual. He nice, you see, it's a void, blank, and if you had to create forms, it is the work of pure. So it is not his God's work, it is the work of his Shakti, of his puissance. Made matter the body of bodiless, infant and dim, the eternal mice above. So, variety of power, different powers now as to, power of life, power of thought, power of mind, power of body, love, joy, whatever you want to call them. Infant and dim, obviously, infant because they have just come up, dim because they are in the darkness there, eternal mice awoke. In inert matter, breathe, a slumbering life. So what is the first thing which has happened? Matter has come first. She has talked of matter. In matter, body is body. Now she is talking of life, slumbering life. In inert matter, breathe. Now therefore actually this life has come out of matter, not because of matter, but because of that fusions. It is not because of matter that out of matter has come. It is because that power is working there, therefore life has come out of matter. In a subconscious life, mind lay asleep. So she is now quickly tracing the steps. Matter, life, then mind. In waking life, he stretched his giant limbs to shake from his proper of his trout, a senseless substance, Quivered into sense. The world's heart commenced to beat, his eyes 
to see his work. The world's heart commands to be. So she has traced in three, four lines the entire course of evolution. Matter, the subconscious life, then waking life, then mind, then senses, etc. In the crowded, dumb vibrations of a brain, thought fumbled in the rain to find itself. That is what we are now seeing. Fumbled to find itself. Discovered speech and fed the newborn world that breast with spans of light, the worlds of ignorance. So that is what the world does. Man has come, he has started speaking, he has found the world. So she is tracing very quickly. So this fellow can absorb it very rapidly. Yeah? So he's very <laughs> sharp. <laughs> All the four or five chapters, he can absorb just through these few sentences. You know, she's not talking about the story of creation. She is uh, talking of involution and now evolution. Thought fumbled in the rain to find itself, discovered speech and fed the newborn word. So it is the speech which is the word, that the divine word of revelation. That bridge with spans of light, the world's ignorance. Now, that bridge with spans of light, who is that, that speech or word? Discover speech and fed the newborn world that bridge. I would say speech after discovering the word. Discover speech and fed the newborn word, that bridge. No, I don't know. Well, let's see. Word. That stands for what? No. Discover speech and fed the newborn word that bridge the spans of light. Thought. Thought fumbled in speech. Discover speech. No, no, no. It's not thought discovered. In the crowded down vibrations of a brain. Yeah, so sorry, thought. Yeah. 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 Speech. Yeah. What does he say? That stands for whom? Uh, it looks like the thought who discover and who bridge. Who? Yeah. No, that stands for. No, no. Thought stands for bridge, speech or word. The two verbs here, it's like the thought. Who do? Who do? No, it is not for word. It has to be speech. It's a speech. Yeah. In waking mind, the thinker built his house. That is what thought. Now, she is describing the stages of thought. She has come now to the stage of waking mind. Means the power of revelation is coming into human compass. A reasoning animal willed and planned and sought. He is to direct among his brute compeers. He built life new, measured the universe. This is what scientists are doing today, you see. He built life new, measured the universe. Opposed his fate and wrestled with unseen powers, conquered and used the laws that rule the world, and hoped to ride the heaven and reach the stars. Well, we have reached the stars today. Huh? Um, we have gone up to Mars. So <laughs> it's not bad. It's, it's quite a big thing, you see. 
we are reading stars. Our uh, our uh, telescope to see different galaxies and all that. We are reading stars, unseen stars. A master of huge environment. Yeah, that is the power of reasoning, animal. Yeah, we pride in it. In reason, it is a gift to us. That gift received because of the fusions working. That we don't admit, you see. <laughs> but it is because that fusion, that gift is there. But then we restrict ourselves own reason. We think that there cannot be anything beyond reason. That is the pity. The pity of reason is that it does not admit anything beyond reason. That there are other faculties of cognition that we don't admit. Waking mind, a reasoning animal. So we are we are basically what? We are a reasoning animal. Man is a reasoning animal. Man is a reasoning animal, but he is not a reasonable animal. <laughs> He is a reasoning animal, but not a reasonable animal. All the outer space. So this is already written in 1947. You see what is happening now. You see, <laughs> he built life new, measured the universe, opposed his fate. Now here he stood erect among his brood compeers. Compeer. Equal colleagues, the same type. This word compare appears twice in Savitri. One is here in Book Six, Canto Two. I did a mighty power had come with her. Is not that power the high compare of fate? The another appear, appearance of the word compare in Savitri, the first appearance of compare in Savitri. Now this is, see Narad is explaining to Savitri's mother about this problem of this world. The riddle of this world he is expounding to her, how it happened, etc., etc. And then Savitri has to face that and Death of her husband, of her lover, and therefore Ashwapati is asking Narad. But then I thought that she has come with a mighty power. Why she should face death? He is asking Narad that is. I did a mighty power had come with her. Is not that power the high compare of fate? The colleague of fate means Savitri <coughs> has that power with her, which will take care of fate. Here, power that power the high compare of fate. Here, he stood erect among his brood compeers. Man, his colleagues, they are not opposing their senses. In the case of Ashwapati's query, the argument is, Savitri if has come with that power, with that fusions, then why should she really suffer at all for anything? She is equally powerful as fate and she, therefore she will not necessarily succumb to fate. He stood erect among his brood compeers. He built life anew, measured the universe, opposed his fate, you see? He opposed his fate because he's compeer. And wrestled with unseen powers. Conquered and you the laws that rule the world. Conquer and you the laws. So we have discovered all the scientific truths, so to say, 
and hope to ride the heavens and reach the star that hope has been fulfilled. <laughs> that hope has been fulfilled. A master of his huge environment. Well, practically a master, you see. Now, the mind's window stares the demigod. So she is quickly tracing the whole history now of evolution. First came matter, came life, came mind, came reasoning power. Now he has become a demigod man. You see. Now, through mind's window stares the demigod. Hidden behind the curtains of man's soul, he has seen the unknown, looked on truth's veilless face. Yes, we have seen the powers of the spirit gone to the Satchirananda also. They receive the seers, they have seen them. A ray has touched him from the eternal sun. Yes, it has come. There are people, seers, sages, who have experienced those things. A ray has touched him from the eternal sun. Eternal sun, of course, the supermind. They have come and touched him. Motionless, voiceless, in death. He stands awake in supernature's light. So from lower nature, he has now entered into the world of Supernature, para prakriti, because the supramental light is touching him. You see, he stands away. He is not transformed, but he is away to that, and see the glory of reason, reason wing, and see the vast descending might of God. So he has now opened himself to the possibilities of God descending into him. So that is the great progress he has already covered. You see, in in about. A dozen sentences, she has opened out the new prospects of man also, you see. 